I uh, first of all, I got to tell you, um, I'm, I probably said this to you maybe when we talked about Bonhoeffer a long time ago. But my, you know, of course, this is one of those questions growing up, you know. But if you knew my my mother, as if you knew my grandmother, you'd know that these were just deeply good people, right? So that's that's the first thing that you say. Because also, what's really weird is when you read my book, I talk about the Greeks and the Germans. I got the sense of humor from the Germans. My mother and grandmother, they never st- my grandmother never stopped joking. It's the craziest thing. You would never expect this from Germans, but they were like, you know, pe- peasants that tumbled out of a Bruegel painting or something. Just a really um oh, I guess because they're maybe they're par- from part of the Germany where Luther's from. There's, there's all this kind of jesting and, you know, coarse joking or something. But just all of that humor I get from my grandmother, from my mother, it's, which is bizarre, but that's in the book. But I was going to say that, you know, I remember my grandmother said that my grandfather would listen to the BBC with his ear literally pressed against the radio speaker because you could be sent to a concentration camp for listening to the BBC during the war. Uh, And they, you know, there's no doubt uh, that he was not on board with what was going on. He managed to stay out of the war until 1943, which is crazy but he he um he he was working in a sewing machine factory and managed to avoid going to war until 1943 and then he was killed uh, on a train heading for the the Russian front that was blown up and he was killed he was 31 my mother was 10 and you know I've I've lived with this my whole life but I remember when I was very little about 5 6 years old we lived in an apartment building in Queens I think we were like the only Gentiles on our floor. I think everybody was Jewish except for us on the floor. And there was a, an older woman, Mrs. Weingarten, who lived down. And my mother and I would go down, and she, my mother would talk to her in German. Mrs. Weingarten was a German Jew, and she showed me once the tattoo of numbers on her arm. And my mother explained this to me, you know. And so I, this has just been part of my whole life growing up and you know i never thought i'd write a book about it but uh obviously i thought about it a lot in the last uh 10 years just because of the bonhoeffer book but i i yeah no that's uh <laughs> i think you have to deal with that right and yeah uh, no uh, of course and i i i would have i would have assumed that you would have which indeed you did just for the record by the way bruegel was dutch so no, no, I know that, but I'm saying know. when how, I think of I love his how painting. You, how, did you, how did they fall out of a Bruegel painting? I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that when you look at one of those paintings, uh, <laughs> I'm you, just, I, I I'm think just that my you a hard time. But, I know, I know, yeah. but but I, my relatives in in Germany they were kind of of that. Uh, you know, Look, either it's, peasant stock. It's or, hilarious or, for you to say you got your sense of humor from from your German and, background. Yeah, it's totally true. I write about it in the book. I'm not kidding. It's, no, no, I believe it's you. Totally it's just true. funny. By the way, did you grow up speaking German and, and Greek? Well, yes and no. Because my parents obviously don't speak each other's languages, the they common language was English. English. Okay. So I grew up speaking English, uh-huh. but I heard tons of of Greek and tons of German, so I can get by in Greek and I can get by in German. I can fool non-native speakers uh, that I'm fluent, and and I can fool native speakers for about three sentences. I hear you. Can you say in either language the essence of effervescence is its quintessence? No. Okay. That's my test. That's my test sentence. Wow. Yeah. That I don't think anybody in any language would, would be able to do that. That would be like really tough. I, I don't. I don't even know if I could do that in English. What happened at age twenty-five? Uh, God spoke to me in a dream. It was as real as anything. It totally changed my life because I knew, without any doubt, it was God. I don't want to give it. It's basically the punchline to the story. But it was utterly miraculous, and I needed a miracle, Dennis, because I was so 
bound up in my own mind. You know, my, my, I had been trained at Yale and in the secular culture to be very, very wary of people who believe in the Bible, uh, you know, of evangelical Christians, of anybody who's conservative. You know, I was really inoculated against that. So the whole idea that I could become one of those people who, who would talk about God or read the Bible, or, you know, I just thought, Ugh, I don't want to be one of those people. And, and yet um, I was in a lot of pain after I graduated Yale. I always, my joke of, version of it is I say that Yale really does communicate to you that life has no meaning. Like, we don't want to get into that. We just want to kind of avoid thinking about the big questions because we don't have any good answers, you know. And uh, and so they say, you know, get a good job and just work really hard and don't think about it. And in a few decades, it'll all be over, you know. So I was an English major. I wanted to be a writer. Therefore, obviously, I did not get a good job. So I had plenty of time to think about it. And uh, that's where I went wrong. And so I floundered around. I ended up moving back in with my parents at age 24, which you don't want to move back in with your parents if they're European working class European immigrants, because even, you know, your Yale friends, their parents would be like, oh, Eric's trying to find himself. And my parents would be like, well, why don't you find yourself a job and get out of here, because we worked really hard to put you through Yale. So it was a really painful time in my life. And I met a guy who was a profound uh, person. Uh, who starts sharing about the Bible with me and God and stuff. And I, I kept him at arm's length during that year as best I could, but I was in so much pain that privately I, you know, I was kind of wondering, but I was not exactly eager to become one of those people who talks about God and Jesus and whatever. And I gotta say that, uh, I, about a year into this, I, God spoke to me in a dream, and I, that's that's the punchline. I won't tell you, but it relates to the title. All right, of the book. we'll be back in a moment. Fish out of water. Eric Metaxas's memoir. Back in a moment. <laughs> 